Hello, and welcome to Problem Solvers University. I'm Dr. Carlos Moore. Um, this is going to be the beginning of my, all of my title pages, just a little bio about me. Basically, I retired from the Air Force uh, 1st of November 2000. I served a little bit more than 20 years, close to 21 years. Um, I'm originally from the Tampa Bay, Florida area. Um, I went to Tampa Bay Technical High School, Gold Titans. Um, basically, I'm doing a seri series of videos uh, concerning uh, all of life um, subject matters that affect each and every one of us. I call it my A through Z um, encyclopedia. But um, we're going to cover the, today's topic is going to be on about addiction. Now, addiction. This may involve the use of substance such as alcohol, inhalants, opioids, cocaine, nicotine, and others, or behaviors such as gambling. Now, addiction may involve the use of um, these substances separately or, or together, but we're going to attack this subject matter uh, based on the fact of um, uh, the way I encounter it from the day-to-day -day activity. Now, what does society have to say about addiction? Well, addiction may involve the use of uh, those substances I stated earlier, uh, but the main substance I see nowadays is fentanyl and um, crack cocaine. Uh, we have a big thing going on in uh, this Tampa Bay region called K2. Uh, some people call it spice and so forth. But what does society have to say about this addiction? There's a scientific evidence that the addicted substance and behavior share a key neuro neurobiological component or feature. They intensely activate brain's pathways a reward and reinforcement, many of which involves neurotransmitter dopamine. Now, both substance use disorders, uh, substance use disorders and gambling behaviors have an increased likelihood of being accompanied by mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety. And other pre-existing problems. Now, some of the things that you're going to see when you, let's say you're riding around town and you see people kind of like in a daze, walking like zombies, there's a probability that those people that you see are going or experiencing a, a battle within their brain with their neurotransmitters. And we're going to talk about the brain a little bit uh, deeper a little later on in some other videos I have. But all I want to say right now is that uh, addiction actually rewires a person's brain. Now, what does the Bible say about doing drugs? Well, the Bible does not directly address any form of, of illicit drugs. We know they had drugs back in those days, but there are no express prohibitions against cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, or meth. There's no mention of marijuana, cannabis, uh, any kind of magic, mushrooms, LSD, acid. Nothing is said about huffing, snorting, dropping, smoking, shooting, licking, or any other method of ingestion. This is not to say, however, that uh, recreation drugs use is permissible just because it's not in the Bible because the Bible does not mention a lot of subject matters that we experience to in today's world. See, back in the ancient world, the medieval times and so forth, they had their own sorts of problems. But the Bible was written uh, and addressed to make us realize that we need some sort of savior. And as a Christian, that is our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, on the contrary, there are several um, clear biblical principles 
that place drug use well outside the realm of acceptable behavior. So the question is, how should a Christian view addiction or more specifically drug addiction? Well, the word addiction has two basic meanings. The first definition, and the one most of us are familiar with, is to cause to become physiologically or psychologically depending on a habit-forming substance. Now, those who are addicted or, as the Apostle Paul says, given too much wine, you know, a lot of people that I, a lot of my clients, they, they're alcoholics. Uh, the Bible called them, these type of people, drunkards or heavy drinkers. You know, if you look in the uh, book of Titus, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, you'll see that they're called drunkards. If you look at First Timothy, chapter 3, uh, they're heavy drinkers. And um, they are disqualified from teaching or holding a position of authority in the church. Now, recently we see a lot of clergy uh, skeletons coming out the closet. Uh, so we, we need to be very careful how we choose a church home that we want to call our family because you got to do some heavy investigation before you just decide to join the church nowadays. Uh, we have a lot of undercover uh, clergy that has more problems than the lay people that's coming to the church service. So, but it is clear that church leadership uh, needs to be sober and self-controlled so that by their examples, they can teach others to be the same. For we know that the apostle Paul said that drunkards shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I didn't say that. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. All believers must not be dependent upon alcohol. That's it. And it stands to reason that this will also apply to addiction to any other substance. For example, drugs, pornography, gambling, gluttony. How many of you out there like to eat? Like to eat in excess? Well, that's a major sin, according to the Bible. So, why not, you may ask? Well, as I said before, uh, believers must always be ready to defend what we believe in. So therefore, we must be sober-minded and without shame of all action. If you notice, if you look back in Genesis, Adam and Eve walked around naked. They weren't shamed at all until they ate from the tree, right? The forbidden tree. All of a sudden, that produces shame they had to hide. Well, that's what happens when we become addicted to a substance. Nobody may not ever know we we addicted, but we have that internal shame. And what we do now, we try to separate ourselves from certain people because we don't want them to uncover uh, this particular maybe addiction we're going through. Now, the second definition of addiction is to occupy oneself with or involve oneself in something habitually or compulsively. Now, this speaks of a unnatural, you know, for a Christian obsession with anything other than God. And that could include sports too, fellas. I know we look a lot, we watch a lot of football, but if it's becoming habitually, compulsively, and it takes away from us serving God, we need to take a look at that. It could include work, shopping, you know, uh, or family, you know, um, if you put anything or anybody above God, then uh, you need to take another look at that. You might have to rearrange your priorities. Now, we are to love the Lord, our God, with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our might. You know, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, 5, you know, that's when... Uh, that's the book. Now, if you don't really know your Bible, turn to the front. It's the, uh, just flip past first, second chapter. You're going to come to the uh, third chapter, fourth chapter. You're going to look at um, Deuteronomy because it's going to be the fifth book 
of the in the Old Testament, and that covers uh, Moses reciting the law for the children of Israel before they go into the uh, Promised Land. And, you know, so I don't want to go backwards, but basically, uh, all old heads had died off. Now, now according to Jesus, the first and greatest commandment which is to love God, okay? Now, we can conclude then that an addiction to anything other than God himself is wrong. God is the only thing that we can and should occupy ourselves with habitually. Now, to do so with anything else, it draws us away from him and it displeases him. Now, God alone is worthy, worthy, of all complete attention, love, and service. Now, to offer these things to anything else, we call idolatry. Christians are to obey the laws of the world. Okay, remember, we're going through some tough times now with our current White House. Um, now, to begin with, Christians are under a universal mandate to respect and obey laws of the land. Several books are written on that in the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 17, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, Matthew chapter 22, Romans chapter 13, T Titus chapter 3, and P 1 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, now, the only instance in which we are allowed to be disobey the law of the land is when the laws violate any divine imperative. You see, basically, it would be an illegal law for a Christian. We can't go against the law of God. You can, and you, you might hope God forgive you for that, but I wouldn't gamble with that. You have to be willing to bear your own cross when those times come up. Because there are no other exception of this rule. Con when I was in the military, I had to follow what we call the UCMJ, the Uniform Court Main for Court Martial. And if uh, uh, one of my leaders would have gave me a, a illegal order, I was to disobey it because I can't uh, obey a unlawful order above my original guy, which is the UCMJ. Now. Contrary to popular belief, simply disagreeing with a law does not constitute a license for breaking that law. Believers obeying the law is hard, but it's necessary. Trust me, I understand. Uh, I am a doctor of theology and physiology, and I run into a lot of people who... Um, they make up rules as they go along to fit. Um, now, many have argued that, for example, marijuana does not warrant prohibition. And today it's legal in a lot of states. Now, the places that are still illegal, they contend that smoking weed, pot, uh, in defiance of the law is justifiable on the, on the grounds uh, that it, it's natural. You know, it's from Mother Earth. Um, they also say the hypocrisy of outlaw, outlaw lawing weed, um, while nicotine and alcohol is legal. See, so what happens is we start rationalizing what's legal and what's illegal. So even though weed in Florida is legal now, you must have a prescription. But I can tell you right now, there's a lot of people smoking weed that don't have a prescription. You know, you talk to some grandmothers and grandfathers, they smoke weed back in the, uh, back in the days of um, um, uh, slavery, you know, back in the days of emancipation. Uh, I hear stories all the time, old heads, they, they smoke that pot now, okay? Now, those who argue at this point may be sincere in their convic conviction, but they are mistakenly nonetheless. Heartfelt disdain for the law does not justify impunity toward it, as our Lord himself made clear. I'm going to tell you what Jesus did. While rebuking the Pharisees for turning the law of Moses into 
an excessively oppressive yoke, Christ still required his disciple to submit to their unfairly harsh demands. Uh, Matthew wrote in chapter 23, verse 1 through 36. Uh, now, submission to authority, you know, if you're like me, I kind of bunk authority sometime because I think the rules are silly, petty, uh, but patience, perseverance through the unjust suffering or perceived unfairness is God's high standard for us as Christians. So it's hard to be a Christian. I tell everybody, you can try to wear that title if you want, but I prefer calling myself a disciple. Anybody can call themselves a Christian because they believe that Jesus existed at one time. Of, but faith requires action. So I have a lot of people tell me I'm a Christian, but they fall short because they don't do anything. They just tell me what they don't do. Well, a disciple has to do uh, things for the kingdom. So uh, even uh, what this means is to abstain from marijuana in compliance with the unfair regulation and to talk to other people that you know who may be violating the law. So believers are not to appear to be lawbreakers. Not only are we to submit to authority and not just for submission's sake, but we're born again, we're Christians, we're believers, and we're further constrained by a mandate to live above reproach for the sake of the gospel. And reproach means that someone can always falsely accuse you of something, but factually they can't ever say that Dr. Moore was out there doing something he don't supposed to do. So needless to say though, criminality is highly reproachable. And so when you're breaking the law, you, you're, you're, put, you're setting yourself up for man's um, consequences. God may forgive you, but you still got to pay the price of the law of the land, which is man. They may try to get you in jail or prison for doing something like that. Believers' bodies belong to God. Drugs can harm this body. So obviously the first principle does not impact drug users living in a nation like the Netherlands uh, where recreation drugs use is uh, legal and permissible. Uh, I was uh, stationed in England back in 1981 through 84 and a lot of people would go over to the Netherlands to the red light district prostitution, drugs, and so forth. But for military, it's still illegal. So, but a lot of people nowadays, they still take that trip there because it's a party town, you know? It's like Corinth in the Old Testament. You know, everybody party, anything goes. Now there are, however, more universally uh, applicable principles. For example, Christians are required to be good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. You know, regardless of our national identity you know uh, this includes our earthly bodies unfortunately illicit illicit drug use is an extremely effective way to destroy your health not just physically but mentally and emotionally as well uh, so that's just a couple reasons why we must take care of our bodies i i actually go to the gym i try to make it at least two or three times a week uh, I used to try to be a bodybuilder, but now I'm just trying to stay alive. But uh, make sure we take care of this temple. <clears throat> lots of dollars and lots and loss of life due to drug abuse. Okay. There was this uh, Dr. Alan Lesnar. Uh, he's a director of a National Institute of Drug Abuse. Uh, he said the most immediate, immediate yet, extensive and long-lasting problem caused by drug abuse both for individual and for society are often medical in nature for example what he was saying is uh known drug abuse related health problems and resulting loss of productivity alone cost all society more than 33 billion dollars each year 
illicit drugs directly cause many medical problems. Stimulants such as cocaine and meth increase the heart rate while constricting the blood vessel. In susceptible individuals, these actions together set the stage for cardiac arrhythmias and strokes. Now, there's a club drug out nowadays, uh, ecstasy. I don't know if too many people still taking that or not. But these users mistakenly believe it's to be safe. You know why? Because everybody using it. They don't see their friends dropping off and so forth because they say, well, it's not crack. I said, well, it's still drug, you know, it's a club drug. And so uh, let's not be fooled about that, you know. Believers who smoke pot is also destroying God's body. Now, as I said earlier, in the state of Florida, it's legal with a medical prescription. Um, but marijuana, while it's been the least harmful of all the illicit drugs, it is still potentially lethal. You see, when you puff on that joint stick, you get a dose of uh, chemicals shooting towards your reward circuit in your brain. Now, that reward circuit is food. And so when you try to return to normal activity, it may not take effect because that pot, that weed, that joint, uh, it fooled the neurotransmitters and it caused your reward circuit to send a signal to your de depressed circuit to say, I need more. And so marijuana uh, potheads, I call them potheads, but they take confidence in the fact that unlike most other drugs, it's seemingly impossible to fatally overdose on weed by means of normal consumption. Now what's normal? I don't know. Uh, could be a, <clears throat> in my days we call it nickel bag, 10 cent bag, but I don't know what's normal now. Maybe a, 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 a duffel bag full. But this does nothing to diminish the potential fatal risk of lung cancer, emphysema, and other forms of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, caused by marijuana smoke. Now, while marijuana can be ingested without smoking it, you know, in the form of creams, uh, brownies, anything that people want to put them in, uh, they think that this eliminates the risk. But there still remains negative um, physiological and psychological consequences, including damage to the reproductive system, the immune system, and your cognitive ability. In the front of your head, inside your brain, you have the prefrontal cortex. Now that causes you to be able to think, remember all sorts of things. So just remember, just cause it's marijuana, don't think you're getting away with something. Now, are you destroying God's temple with drug use? So, beyond the stewardship as a Christian, all bodies are not our own. We have been bought with a price. Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And he says, not with things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood as of lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. See, so you can look that up for yourself in the book, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 through 19. Bottom line is, when you call yourself a Christian and you have faith in the works of Jesus Christ, you're saying that by having this faith, I'm justified. Now, the only reason you're justified because Jesus died. He shed his blood for you. Now, if you really understand what the word, the Bible is trying to tell you, your body is not your own anymore. You're a slave to Christ. Now, I know a lot of people hate that word slave. We don't want to be slave to anybody. We don't want to be slave to our job, our employers, our husbands, our wives. We don't like to be obedient to anything or anybody. But as a Christian, hey, I, I'm here to tell you, we are slaves to Jesus Christ. 
because having bought us for his own life, Christ has delighted to create in us something entirely new, something somewhat bizarre in a sense, because by the indwelling uh, in us with the Holy Spirit, he has turned us into organic temples of some sorts of. So, so now caring for hell is not just a matter of good stewardship, it's a matter of uh, reverential pity because to pollute or harm our bodies is to desecrate the house of God. You know, you are, if you wanna look at it this way, you are a Christian, that means you have been recycled, you've been renewed. You are now uh, a new creature. You're really not a human anymore. Uh, you know, look up in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. Um, it could be wonderful and terrifying at the same time because you are now, uh, you are now like a church house because the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And that Holy Spirit should be your comforter, your guide, and your guide to understand the spiritual things of God because you can't understand that on your own. That's why a lot of non-believers don't understand when we start talking about the word because they don't have the Holy Spirit to help interpret, to enlighten, uh, to demodulate the information for them. Now, sobriety means the state of being sober. Are you? <laughs> I always like to say that. <clears throat> I'm always high. I'm high on the word, okay? Sometimes I do take a drink. I remember there used to be a time, boy, you could not keep me off alcohol when I was in the military. Me and my boys in Japan, Yokota Air Base, we used to indulge in that alcohol because we didn't, we never harmed anybody. We never got in trouble, but it was a, it was a way we kind of grew up in the military, smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, having fun, uh, a lot of house parties. And you know, that was pretty good, but you know, um, as I reflect back on those days, I feel kind of like King Solomon, you know, on his deathbed. It's like, what did it all mean? Vain, vain, vain. It meant nothing, really. But it served its purpose during that time. Um, so, um, another biblical principle concerns the susceptibility to deceptions. Because as fallible creatures, we are prone to delusion. So, and, and since we are the objects of God's intense affection, his enemies are our enemies. This includes the enemy, the devil, the father of lies. John called the devil the father of lies in John chapter 8, verse 44. Uh, he's a most uh, formable and determined adversary. All of the apostolic exhortations, uh, to remain sober-minded and alert are designed to remind us that we must be vigilant against the wiles of the devil who seeks to ensnare us through deception. Sobriety is also important for prayer as is obedience to God. And the bottom line is, if you're fuzzy-headed, uh, Satan has a way to attack you and you won't even know he's coming. Now, I used to teach this thing. It's called TIS, T-I-S. Um, you know, the way Satan affects us is through our thoughts. He affects us by giving us ideals, and he suggests things to us. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. These are the three ways that Satan can ensnare you, especially when you are high, drunk, okay? Psychological addiction versus physical addiction. As for drug addiction, not all illicit drugs are physically addictive, but nevertheless, they are psychologically addictive. While most people are familiar with physical addiction, which is the progression condition where about the human body becomes physically dependent upon a drug in order to function properly. Psychological addiction is less well known. 
Psychological addiction is an enslavement of the mind, often characterized by obsessive tendencies and lack of desire to quit. So, while physical addiction brings the body into subjection, psychological addiction brings the will into submission. Users tend to say things like, I could quit if I want to, but I just don't want to. Now, this attitude tends to ensure a long-term pattern of drug use whereby users become devotees in defiance of a very pognate Bible principle, pognate Bible principle. And here's what I'm saying. The fact is, no one can wholeheartedly serve two masters. You know, Jesus said that, right? Now, if you look in the book of Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 22, and Luke uh, chapter 16, verse 13. So any time uh, spent kneeling before the God of drugs, it's a time spent with your bike toward God in the Bible. You see, a lot of times when you go to AA meetings, they say just believe in a higher power. Well, we got to be very careful as Christians. Because when you call yourself a Christian, that means you'll follow Jesus Christ. You're not following the God of Frog or the God, the Sun God or the Baal. You're, you have a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. That is the God that you say you believe in if you call yourself a Christian. Now, the word Christian is only mentioned three times in the book of Acts. So, therefore, I tell my students, it'll be better for them to call themselves disciples. Because that means that you're a disciple of Christ. That means you're a mentee. Jesus is your mentor. And the way you're being disciple is by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. So, when you pray, the Holy Spirit is actually praying on your behalf through Jesus Christ to God. That is the process of praying and communicating with God. But remember, God is a spirit. Jesus Christ is God. The Holy Spirit is God. It's in three persons, but as one. I always tell students to uh, think of a pretzel, even though it's three segments. It is still called one pretzel, an egg. You got a shell, you got the white, you got the yolk. Water, same thing, you know. Um, liquor form, frozen form, um, or mist. You see, so it's still, it's one. Now, I won't get too deep into that, but I just want to remind you that um, if you're serving your drug God or this habitual God, it's very hard for you to serve the God, the triune God. And you have to make sure that you give God all of you. And sometimes that's hard because I know addiction is tough to overcome, but let's think about we always need to be recycled. That's why when we say born again, uh, we've been regenerated. Say to yourself, I'm still being recycled. I'm not finished. God hasn't finished with me yet, but it's a journey that I welcome because the final product, I already know what it's going to look like because the Bible tells me what it's going to look like. Okay? Now, in summary, the Bible teaches us that denying ungodliness and unworldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the presence of this world. Uh, you can find that in Titus chapter 2, uh, verse 12. Uh, I want to thank you for being such patient students. Sometimes I rattle on and on, but I get so caught up. I told you I get high off of the Bible. Uh, and my objective is to create these videos to teach and to inspire and to motivate everyone to have a closer walk with God. So if you have found this video or any other videos to be helpful in your walk with God, then please send us. A generous donation as you are led by the Holy Spirit please make all donations um, you can make your donations to dr. Carlos Moore post office box 871 Sefna Florida zip code 33583-871 
Also, don't forget to visit my bookstore now. Uh, I have several books I've written, and you can find them at lulu.com. Um, purchase one, purchase all of them. That'll help me out. You got to understand, I'm in the community doing a lot of this uh, seminars free of charge. Um, you see how I look on that picture? Uh, that's just me. I'm happy all the time. Uh, for those who don't really know me, uh, I'm six foot four, about 270. Uh, never played in a professional ball, but uh, I played a lot of football and basketball in the Air Force. But I say that to say this, man. We once was more than we think we are now. And so keep your heads up and stay in the world and attend church. Find your church home where you can regularly visit. That's it for now. I'll talk to you next time.